Good morning, everybody. Also from my side, welcome to our first session on monetary policy and financial market. I am Wolfgang Lemke. I am from the monetary policy department, one of the organizers of this conference. As you heard in Philip Lane's keynote this morning, financial markets are important for transmission. We learn a lot about from financial markets on, for example, inflation expectations, as some of you alluded to already in your questions. And um, I'm happy to welcome on stage four renowned economists who work on these matters and um, will be part of the session. So we have two speakers, Luigi Boccola from Stanford. We have Christian Wagner from Vienna University, two discussants, Claudiana Estrefi from Banque de France and Fabian Schupp from ECB Monetary Policy. So we will have 30 minutes for each presentation and 10 minutes for discussion and then some time also for questions from your side. So without further ado, Luigi will present the first paper on bond market views of the Fed. And Luigi, the floor is yours. Thank you. OK, so thanks, um, Wolfgang, for the introduction and for inviting the for having the paper into the program. So this is joint work with uh, Alessandro Dovis. Kasper Jorgensen, who's here at the ECB, and uh, Richard Kirpanani, and this is about bond market views of the Fed. So let me tell you a little bit how we start to think about this, uh, this issue. So following the pandemic, we have seen this large increase in inflation in the US and in many other countries. Now, in, with insight, that was not very surprising given the type of shocks that the US economy experienced at the time, going from supply chain di uh, disruption to increases in energy prices, expansionary fiscal policy, so all things that should uh, increase inflation. However, alongside those shocks, many observers also pointed out to a shift of the Federal Reserve stance on inflation toward a more dovish policy. Now, similar to many other countries, the Federal Reserve kept uh, interest rate at zero throughout 2021, despite the uh, large increase in inflation that we were observing. And in the US case, those policy actions were sort of consistent with the adoption of the new uh, monetary policy framework that was centered on this concept of flexible average inflation targeting. So the idea that you could overshoot 2% for some time. What we're gonna ask in this paper is, first of all, uh, did the private sector change their view about the, if you want, the Federal Reserve monetary policy reaction function during this period? And to what extent, uh, a shift in uh, uh, the, uh, the reaction function can contribute to the inflationary uh, dynamics that we have seen. And in order to answer this question, we're gonna proceed in two steps. Uh, first, we're gonna uh, use high frequency financial market data to detect shift in the uh, reaction function. And second, we're gonna combine this estimate with the New Keynesian model to measure the role of monetary policy during this episode. So let me try to give you an idea about how we are gonna uh, sort of a, uh, measure empirically uh, this shift in the uh, policy rule using bond market data. And to do so, I'm gonna uh, sort of start with a very simple uh, reaction function. So suppose that the monetary authority follows a very simple Taylor rule where nominal rates are you know, uh, moved in order to uh, control deviation of inflation from uh, a target pi bar and there are some uh, transitory deviation from the rule, these monetary shocks that are assumed to be IID in this simple example. Now, what is the want operator here? So we want to basically test for changes in psi pi in this sensitivity of nominal interest rate to inflation. And going back to something that uh, uh, Philip Lane was talking about in the keynote, we also want to measure the expected duration of this uh, uh, shift in the policy regime because whether you are affecting short-term rates or long-term rates is gonna matter a lot for the response of inflation. Now, the issue when we look at realized data, like uh, you know, just realized data on nominal rates and inflation, is that we're gonna have only a few years to test this hypothesis all at the zero lower bound, where by construction nominal rates are not sensitive to inflation. So rather than looking at realized data, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at expectation data. So the idea is that we're gonna forward this equation in time, take the expectation at some future year k, and when you do so, 
uh, you're basically end up with a Taylor rule in expectation space. So rather than having realized data here, we're gonna have expectation data. And from the mod market prices, we're gonna basically obtain some measurement of this uh, uh, at the daily frequency of uh, uh, risk neutral expectation of future nominal rates and future inflation. And uh, why do expectation data are gonna be useful for our purpose here? Well, first of all, we're gonna have information even if we are currently at the zero lower bound. Like to the extent that uh, the economy is gonna go away from the zero lower bound, the nominal rates are gonna contain some information about the systematic policy rule. Moreover, and this is gonna be key, we can actually exploit the term structure of this inflation expectation, like we can vary K to measure the persistence of the change in, uh, in, a, in this uh, uh, coefficient uh, uh, in the mind of uh, uh, you know, traders at the time. Let me try to give you a scatter plot, like a sort of a, a preview of our main empirical results. And I'm gonna do that with a very simple graph. So let's look at this graph here. On the y-axis, we have expected future nominal interest rate. On the, uh, on the X axis, expected future inflation. So think about on average over a 10 year horizon. So these are gonna be sort of a long run uh, expectation. Each dot here represents a day, a trading day. The blue dots are the period just before COVID. So these are all observation between 2017 and 2019. The red dots are the one uh, during the, um, you know, post COVID up to the lift off. Uh, so what we can see is, first of all, uh, you know, there is this very strong relationship between expected future nominal interest rate, expected future inflation, as a simple Taylor rule would suggest. So the R square of this uh, regression is uh, above 0.9. Second, we do see when we compare these two subsample that the slope of this relationship is flatter uh, during uh, uh, the um, pandemic years uh, than it was before. When you do this on a more systematic uh, manner and you compute the slope of this relationship over the past 25 years, and these are the coefficient that are plotted here, you, you do recover basically this result that there was fairly stable expectation about how future nominal interest rate would respond to future inflation up to 2020, and in particular they would respond by a factor of 1.5. Uh, during these periods, we are gonna see this unusual reduction in this uh, sensitivity. Uh, and if you actually look at the uh, kind of the term structure, which uh, uh, sort of forecast horizon is driving this reduction in the slope, is gonna come mostly from the medium, medium term. So the zero to five years is gonna basically gonna be uh, what um, the data is gonna suggest uh, is unusual relative to the previous period. Uh, now, this is gonna be the main result. Uh, we are gonna uh, show that it's robust to more sophisticated policy rules. So right now I, I illustrated with a very simple rule, but we're gonna have interest rate smoothing, time varying intercept and output gap there. Uh, we're gonna, uh, of course, there is a problem. I mean, there is a question about how we go from risk neutral to physical expectation. So there are all issues that potentially could explain uh, a drop in the coefficient, but somehow the results are gonna be robust once we try to control for those. So that's gonna be the main empirical result. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna essentially try to go to the second question is, uh, how do these changes in the, in the policy rule affect inflation? And to do so, we are basically gonna do more of a back on the envelope calculation rather than a very sophisticated analysis. So we're gonna uh, take a baseline New Keynesian model, like really think about the Galli textbook model. Uh, and the only twist that we're gonna have is that we are gonna basically allow the monetary policy rule to fluctuate between an historical regime uh, and a flexible average inflation targeting regime where uh, the nominal rates respond to a backward looking average of, uh, of inflation rather than current inflation. We're gonna use this model to explain the rise in inflation and uh, the data on output gap and nominal rates during this period. And the model is basically gonna tell you that you're gonna need a combination of uh, negative supply and positive demand shocks to explain the rise in inflation and a switch to a less responsive uh, uh, monetary policy. So you're gonna need this persistence uh, that is uh, sort of coming from the, from the backward looking average of inflation to replicate the data. 
Now, what is going to be the counterfactual that we are going to do is like suppose that you didn't have the shift to flexible average inflation targeting. So suppose that you stayed with the uh, uh, previous historical Taylor rule. What would have been the dynamic of inflation that we observe uh, uh, during this period? The model is basically going to say that this shift in the rule was very powerful. So inflation would have peaked at only 5 percent absent this shift in the uh, uh, in the flexible average inflation targeting rather than nine. However, uh, this is going to come mostly from, from a bug of this model. It's going to come essentially for what we call uh, uh, the forward guidance puzzle squared. So I'm going to explain what it is uh, going forward. Uh, so that's basically uh, the paper. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, sort of explain a bit better uh, the empirical part and then we're going to go to the counterfactual. Uh, so let's start with the data. So these are going to be daily data on nominal and uh, inflation protected yields on zero coupon bonds. Uh, so the main sample is going to be between 2000 and 2022. So why do we look at the uh, zero coupon uh, bonds? Well, uh, standard asset pricing theory tells us that yields on uh, a nominal bond that matures k years from now are going to be sort of uh, um, informative about the average of the short-term real rates over the life of the bond, over the next k years. This is under the risk-neutral measure. Uh, and uh, you can think about the nominal bond yield as revealing the physical expectation, like the true actual expectation of the nominal rates over this horizon plus a term premium component. Similarly, we can uh, uh, compute uh, inflation compensation, which is the difference in yields uh, on a nominal and a, a, a tip uh, that, that matures k period from now. And you are going to have expected uh, future inflation over the life of the bond, plus potentially an inflation risk premium. Now, of course, once you have the entire uh, term structure, you can compute uh, uh, forward. So you can basically not just look at averages of inflation uh, between now and five years from now, you can look at the average inflation between year three and four or year five and six. And these are things that we're going to uh, exploit in the analysis. Uh, so that's the data. So what we're going to uh, start, we're going to start with the Taylor rule, similar to the one that I showed you before, uh, with the difference that now we allow for an interest rate smoothing component and uh, a potentially time varying intercept. For now, there is no output gap. Uh, I'll, I'll talk later about what changes when you have an output gap. And what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to, again, uh, uh, do the same thing that I've done in, in the introduction a few slides ago. I'm going to take expectation today of the variable k years from now. Uh, and we are uh, basically back with this equation here. Uh, now, rather than working with expectations, we're going to work with forecast updates. So basically, rather than looking at what is the expectation uh, today of the nominal rates 10 years from now, we're going to look at what's the forecast update today of the same object 10 years from now. And the reason why we do that is because uh, um, I'm going to argue that some of this, uh, 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 some of this term here are going to essentially be uh, canceling. So why, why is that the case? Well, basically, what I've done is I just took the forecast updates. So we have the forecast updates about future measure of nominal interest rate, future inflation, the, uh, you know, the um, uh, um, natural rate of interest I star, and the, the future monetary policy shock years from now. Uh, so the assumption we're going to make is that daily forecast revision of future monetary policy shocks are going to be small. Now, in any given day, we don't really get news about monetary policy. So here, we are not really thinking just about FOMC meetings. We are thinking about, you know, on any given day, we don't really get news about uh, monetary policy. And in addition, if K is big enough and the epsilon are transitory, like people typically document in the data, uh, those forecast updates are going to die out. So they're going to be close to zero. Similarly, we are going to sort of assume that uh, daily forecast revision of the natural rate of interest are going to be negligible. So we're going to think about the natural rate of interest as some slow moving process so that in any given day, you don't really get much update from that. 
So once we have uh, that, uh, we are basically back to an equation that looks like the one I shown you before. Uh, so on the left hand side, we have a forecast update of uh, some measure of a uh, nominal interest rate. Uh, on the right hand side, we have uh, uh, some forecast update about future inflation. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna test for the stability of the slope of this relationship. So essentially we're gonna have uh, uh, our full sample, we are going to partition uh, uh, the full sample into six subsamples of roughly equal length, four years. Uh, and uh, we are going to fix rho, uh, this, uh, the persistent to 0.8, which is consistent with structural estimates of uh, Taylor rule. And for now, we are going to just assume uh, sort of the, we are going to swap the risk neutral with the physical expectation. So we're going to conduct our analysis with the risk neutral expectation. Later in a robustness, we try to infer the term and inflation risk premium to clean up the data. Now the baseline is we're going to look at the expected average inflation and nominal interest rate over the next 10 years. But then I'm going to split this uh, 10 years average into three, like expectation of short term, like between now and two years from now. Uh, expectation between three and five years, which I'm going to call the medium term, and expectation between years six and ten, which I'm going to call the long term. So here is basically uh, the first main result that I was uh, talking about. So this is uh, in the graph that I plotted at the beginning is the, the slope coefficient. So uh, you basically see that the slope coefficient is very stable for over 20 years. Uh, it's around 1.5. And then you have a, a sort of drop in the 2020, 2022 period to a value of one. Uh, now let's sort of break down this into the different pieces, like short, medium, and long term. And this is what uh, this part of the table does. So this is the zero to two years forecast horizon, three to five, six to 10. So when we look at the zero to two year forecast horizon, uh, typically you are gonna see smaller coefficients and more time variation. So in particular, you're gonna see unresponsive monetary policy also in 2012, 2015, uh, like it was in 2020, 2022. Now this forecast horizon, the zero to two, we know from previous research is also affected by expectation of the zero lower bound constraint binding. In particular, during this period, the expectation of the ZLB, of the persistence of the ZLB uh, were, were pretty high and therefore it's sort of, uh, uh, contaminated uh, uh, by this time varying expectation of, uh, of the ZLB coefficient. What is special about the current period relative to the past is that the medium and to some extent also the longer run expectation uh, changed relative to before. So for example, if we look at the three to five years forecast horizon, we see uh, sort of uh, some stability uh, up to 2020 on average a value of two, and then you have a big drop in 2020, 2022. And the similar case is uh, for the six to 10 years, although to a, a lower extent. So here is basically uh, a plot that summarizes this discussion. So what I'm plotting here is I'm not plotting anymore just the, the coefficient psi, I'm plotting the difference between uh, psi pre-2020 and, and post-2020. So uh, this is the point estimate. This is a 99% confidence uh, interval. So essentially what you see is that uh, there is this uh, drop in the sensitivity, uh, especially for, shorter, uh, for the short to medium run. So in a forecast horizon up to year five. When we look at long run expectation, we cannot really reject the null hypothesis that uh, um, you know, the, the, the policy regime was, was not uh, um, different from, from any different from uh, uh, the previous uh, 20 years. So in our view, these results are consistent with uh, uh, sort of the communication and the action of the Federal Reserve Bank at the time. In particular, uh, going to the adoption of the flexible average inflation targeting. So what it, what it was or the way that it was described it was basically described as sort of a, you know, uh, a way to let over sh inflation overshoot for a while, s given that in the past we were undershooting it. So essentially the Fed was signaling that they would let inflation go 
you know, for, for, a, for a while, they, they, they didn't really sort of clarify the time horizon. But uh, for a while, you let inflation going up a bit. And uh, similar to, to sort of the uh, August 2020 statement, all the uh, FOMC press releases, like uh, 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 around 2021, were sort of consistent with this idea that because inflation has been low for a while, and we expect this inflation to be transitory, therefore we are not really going to act. And this was sort of consistent in our view with the decline in the sensitivity of uh, nominal interest rate to current inflation uh, over the short to medium run. Now, of course, there are other ways to uh, interpret uh, these uh, results. Um, and uh, uh, here in the paper, we point out to three alternative explanation that could rationalize a fall in the sensitivity of nominal interest rate to, to inflation that have nothing to do with a change in the policy rule. So uh, let me briefly discuss those. So one of those uh, is the presence of the output gap in the policy rule combined with uh, a, a, a change in the mix of shocks that the economy is facing. So what do I mean by that? Well, suppose that pre-COVID, uh, it was mostly demand shock that were driving the economy. And post-COVID, uh, it was mostly supply shocks. Then you would naturally expect future nominal rates to be less sensitive to inflation post-COVID than before, because it's just harder to stabilize the economy uh, uh, when you have supply shocks. So that's basically uh, 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 one thing that could lead to a bias in, uh, in PSI in the direction of what we find. Uh, so the way that we control for this, uh, um, or at least we, we, we uh, control for this alternative story, is that we repeat the analysis this time conditioning on the same type of shock before and after the pandemic. So rather than uh, focusing on the entire data, we're going to look at the sort of uh, at variation in this forecast update that is uh, conditional on the same type of shock. And in particular, we're going to look at the monetary policy shock. And when we do this analysis, we obtain comparable results to the one uh, that, that uh, I just showed you. Uh, there are other possible stories that could explain this decline in the sensitivity. One is, uh, uh, you know, a, a time varying uh, perception of how much the zero hour bound will bind in the future. Uh, we, we basically can control explicitly for that in, in the analysis by incorporating the zero hour bound in, in the regression, and that's something that we do, and we still find uh, a reduction in the sensitivity even after you control for, for this possibility. And of course, uh, you know, uh, the data that we are using are not exactly, uh, are not physical expectation. They are contaminated by the presence of risk premia and uh, uh, on both uh, the, the nominal and the, and the real tips. Uh, and uh, we do something in the paper, like we, we try to essentially take out the risk premium component for both and repeat the analysis and find similar results. So at the end, we kind of came up with this with, uh, uh, it's not implausible that what we are finding is actually uh, related to uh, sort of a change in the, in the way that the market perceive the, the Fed is gonna operate over the next five years. So the second part of the paper, we try to say, okay, let's take this measurement, let's put it into a model, and let's see what it implies for uh, inflation, okay? And uh, when we do that, we could take uh, two different routes, like we could go with uh, a very sophisticated medium run, medium um, scale DSG model and do the analysis, or we could go with the simplest one we, we uh, we have in mind, which is the three equation model, and uh, have it more as a back on the envelope calculation. We decided to do the second because it was sort of in instructive for us to understand what are the key feature of the model that matter for this type of counterfactual. And I think we found some way of actually uh, um, showing that. So let me, let me go. So uh, this is uh, the, the, the standard three equation model. You're gonna have households now, this theta tilde is going to be a discount factor shock. People typically refer to as uh, a demand shock in this class of models. You could think about this as capturing a reduced form, the fiscal policy uh, thing that we're going on. Like, I, I have a, a paper with Alessandro Dovis and uh, David Berger that actually makes this point. Like, you have a, 
an heterogeneous agent economy and you do a redistribution, you basically, it shows up in the representative agent economy as a discount factor shock. So that's gonna be capturing the one factors. Uh, we're gonna have shocks to the markup of uh, the uh, intermediate good producers. And that's gonna show up as a supply shock, like a shock to the Phillips curve. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the key twist relative to the standard model uh, is that we're gonna have uh, uh, the monetary authority following a Marco switching uh, regime rule, like in the work of Bianchi and, and many others. So uh, what are gonna be the two rules? Uh, they're basically gonna differ in what you are uh, targeting. Like, uh, are you targeting the current inflation or are you targeting a backward looking average of inflation uh, sort of to capture the spirit of this uh, uh, um, flexible average inflation targeting regime? Uh, uh, there is going to be the output gap in the, in the rule and some interest rate smoothing component. So that's the model otherwise, it's, uh, a, it's very standard. Uh, now to parameterize the model, uh, I'm not going to go uh, too much into the weeds, but essentially what we do is we uh, look at the model with the historical terror rule and estimate it with Bayesian methods with data before COVID, so we kind of do the uh, standard estimation there. Now to parameterize the uh, flexible average inflation targeting rule, what we do is we do indirect inference using the empirical analysis that I shown you before. So essentially what we do is we replicate in the model the same regression of expected future nominal interest rate to expected future inflation that we run in the data and we try to match as close as possible the uh, drop in the slope that is measured using uh, uh, those, those uh, that we measured using those regression. So it's sort of a, um, uh, using indirect inference. Now, once we have uh, uh, calibrated the model, we can essentially do this uh, uh, um, counterfactual analysis. So the first step of the counterfactual analysis is to ask the model to replicate the data. So essentially, suppose that this was the truth, what do you need your model to feature in order to replicate uh, the path of output, inflation, and nominal interest rate that we see in the data? And the model is basically going to tell you, well, in order to replicate uh, this path, like you are going to have a recovery of output, you're going to have uh, inflation going up, and you're going to have zero nominal interest rate, well, you're going to need uh, a sequence of demand shocks uh, that uh, uh, of positive demand shocks that essentially let the economy recover. You're gonna need some markup shock initially because you do see inflation above 2% even uh, when output is below, uh, is below trend. So the only way that you can get that is to a shock in the Phillips curve. And you're gonna need a, a switch to the uh, flexible average inflation targeting regime. So the model tells you by this time, you know, with inflation at 7%, output was a bit below uh, zero, you, you, you should see nominal rates being up, like if you were to follow the historical rule. So uh, you, you, you need the shift to the flexible average inflation targeting because it builds more persistent than the historical rule. So once we have the, uh, the sequence of shocks, we can basically do the counterfactual. Okay, what would have been the path of output, inflation, and nominal interest rate if uh, you had the shift to the uh, uh, if you didn't have the shift to the flexible average inflation targeting regime, to the, to the second regime. And this is basically going to be the red line. So you would have had uh, a, a weaker recovery, of course. Uh, output would have been below what we uh, have observed. And you would have be, had uh, uh, lower inflation. So that's, that's basically how the Neocanadian model works. Now, qualitatively, this is uh, very intuitive. What's, what's staggering here is the magnitude. So if you look at the uh, effect on inflation, basically, just the change in the policy rule account for over half of the increase in inflation that we've seen. And the question is like, OK, why does the neo Keynesian model gives you such a big number here? Well, at the end of the day, this is the calculation that was uh, mentioning, and it sort of relates to what uh, uh, Philip Lane was talking about in the keynote speech. So, you take inflation in the neo Keynesian uh, in the neo Keynesian model. It's a forward-looking variable of uh, uh, the output gap. Uh, you take the output gap; it's a forward-looking variable of uh, uh, real rates. And you now think about how does the policy regime affect these things? 
Well, essentially, it's not going to affect the shocks, so they cancel when you think about this counterfactual. What's going to affect, it's just going to affect the path of future real rates. So when you shift, uh, it's not just a simple monetary shock that it's an IID blip. When you change the, the rule, you have a change in the entire path of future real rates. And uh, what is uh, uh, true in the neo keynesian model is that future real rates are going to have a big effect on inflation, even if the slope of the Phillips curve is small. The reason being that the sensitivity of inflation to future real rate is actually increasing. So in the forward guidance puzzle, when you look at the output gap, the sensitivity is flat. So it's not uh, like the, the, real the change in the real rate five years from now is going to have the same effect on output than a change in the real rate two years from now. But when you look at inflation, because it's a forward-looking variable of the output gap, the change in real rates are going to be even uh, more consequential. So you basically have this very large uh, uh, in sensitivity of inflation to real rates that is built into uh, these two equations. That explains why we get this uh, uh, large effect. So uh, let me conclude. So um, we, we presented a novel approach to test for perceived shifts in the monetary policy rule, and we think we found some robust evidence of a shift uh, to a more dovish uh, regime shortly after the pandemic. And when you couple that with an off-the-shelf New Keynesian model, you find a pretty sizable effect, although there is the Kuhn granos uh, caveat that this is actually coming from uh, you know, too much forward-lookingness that is, that is in the model. And I'm minus 0 0.22, so let me give the, uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Luigi. Uh, thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to discuss this, uh, uh, what, I, what I think is important, provocative, but also very timely paper. Why it's important? Um, during the history, central bankers actually often, in the history of high inflation, often use uh, 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 other factors, external factors or non-monetary factors to, to blame uh, uh, why inflation happens or why it's more difficult this time to deal with inflation. And uh, so there have been unions, farmers, uh, oil prices, governments, greed. And this is important because uh, it asks, what about the role of monetary policy in either being source of inflation or propagating, uh, propagating inflation to the, to the economy? And this is timely because in the, in, in the, in the recent episodes uh, of inflation, the Fed made significant changes to, to its uh, uh, framework, to its policy framework. And when, among other things that it changed, it, it communicated that it will allow temporary overshoot from inflation target. It's not only communicated, but also action supported this, this communication. And why it is timely? It's timely because both the Fed and the ECB have announced that they will have a review or assessment of their framework. And therefore, insights from this type of, of research are, are crucially for, uh, crucial for evaluating the effectiveness of these frameworks and if there are uh, uh, things that should be changed or improved in this, in this, in this framework. So very, very shortly, uh, I see this paper fitting in, in the literature that tries to assess the role of systematic monetary policy for, for the economy. And here, the, the Fed's uh, uh, change in the policy framework is really a nice event. Nice event, with, uh, speaking from the researcher's point, point of view, uh, to, to assess this role. And the, the, the more focused question is to understand the role of, of this change in, in, in policy for, for what I call the great inflation, or you would call dynamics of, of inflation for 2020, 2022. So what they do, they work in two steps. In the first step, they they assess the effect of a change in, in the strategy on, on inflation, on expectations, interest rate and inflation expectations, looking at the data. So the first part is an empirical approach, uh, looking at uh, bond market data, therefore the bond market's view of, of, of the Fed. Then in a second step, they use some of the insight from, from this exercise and to assess the, the role of, of this change 
for the broader economic uh, uh, developments. And here they use theory, so it's a theory-based assessment uh, using a new Keynesian, new Keynesian model. So I don't want to now to repeat all the results, but in, in simple words, it works. The strategy worked uh, what, what it actually announced to do, to, to, to reduce the sensitivity of inflation expectations to, to interest rates. So in this respect, it's, it's a success. So communication and policy works to, uh, to shift expectations where, where the central banker wanted. But if we look from the broader economic impact, it's a policy failure because inflation would have been different under a, 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 different, a different rule. So, my, uh, so, okay, so we have a weakened correlation which aligns well with the strategic uh, com uh, review communication and the actions of, of the Fed. But it's very challenging to assign this uh, weak correlation to policy rule because uh, for many factors, uh, many reasons that, that Luigi mentions. Second, is even more challenging to attribute this, this change to specific components in the rule. So there are many assumptions that need to go uh, uh, to, to, to come to this uh, correlation that is coming from, from policy. And authors are very, very transparent actually in, in discussing many of the, uh, the assumptions that go uh, in these calculations and they, they discuss and tackle uh, many of them. At the end, I, I wonder actually, what do we learn about the, the, the rule or the new rule? The perceived baseline rule is linking interest rates to inflation expectations. Uh, but the Fed strategy review or the framework actually emphasized also employment by putting a strong and a symmetry and priority to, to, to this part of the objective. And, uh, and I wonder now, what are we learning about, about the rule given that there is this other part of the objective which is it's a dual objective, but in this strategic review also takes a, a more prominent role. And the view of, of, of many, let's say, academics out there is that it is this emphasis on the maximum employment and prioritize, prioritizing the labor market, which, which led the, the, the Fed to postpone the, the, the rate, the, the hike. So given this, I wonder how we can identify market inference when the rule is complex or more complex. So, and this would be very important to, to assess the, the current framework and, and uh, to have lessons from, uh, from, from the new one. Is there something that we should remove from the, the current framework? Is this the emphasis on, on labor, on uh, output, on prices, on climate? Uh, this would be very, very important for to assess the, the, the current frameworks. Then uh, I have another uh, question. Why was the Fed so credible in allow, that it will allow inflation overshooting? The forward guidance in, in the, the policy statements has also a, a, a clause which reads the following. The committee would be prepared to adjust the stance of monetary policy as, uh, if risk, as appropriate if risks emerge that could impede the attainment of the committee's goal. So this is the typical, if we work with communication, it's a typical uh, clause that we have in, in, in statements, we stand ready to, to use tools. And why did markets actually not put a weight on this clause, that they would be ready to, 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 to jump in if, if, the, 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 if the objectives are, are in danger? Why the em emphasis on the employment overshadowed the signals of a potential tightening from a Fed that is assumed to be a hawkish Fed for 40 years? Here I have, uh, uh, I want to bring uh, uh, my view and uh, an explanation of this that is the Fed didn't become dovish with the strategic review. The Fed was already dovish during the strategic review, uh, after the strategic review, but also much time before the strategic review. And where do we see this? Here I present a chart of the balance of the FOMC in terms of hawks and doves. And this balance is from 1960s that I have built in previous in my, in my research work. And you see that this balance of hawks and doves varies considerably over time. So you don't see a hawkish regime for 40 years, but different, uh, different regimes. 
And post-2009, it has been a predominantly dovish majority. This is not a, a dovish majority, in, in, dovish in the sense of policy, but dovish in the sense of who are people sitting there and voting on monetary policy. And you can see that the, 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 the red line is the 12 voters, and the, the, the dashed line is the, the, the rotating regional uh, Fed president. So not all FOMC is, is, is dovish at this, at this period. And with this measure, we have shown with my co-authors that you can get causal evidence on the effects of hawkish and dovish switches on how different shocks propagate into the economy. Finally, to go to the model, um, there are large effects on monetary policy, on, on, on inflation. And again, uh, uh, authors are very careful to say that these, there are many assumptions behind these models, and these should be considered as an upper bound. And they, they plan to address the, the forward guidance puzzle. I have another list, uh, wish for, for the authors to, if possible, to improve on the monetary policy rule that enters in this, in this model. So what is the, the rule uh, in the model? Is a regime shift between a hawkish and a dovish, uh, a dovish regime that is supposed to, to mimic the, the strategic review shift. However, the assumption of a 40-year uh, uh, hawkish regime with a three-year dovish regime is debatable. Debatable based on the historic uh, evidence that we have on, on monetary policy rules, but also in this variation that I showed you with who is deciding monetary policy, which is much more volatile than we typically uh, think uh, uh, on these regimes. The other thing is that the regimes are assumed to, the switch is assumed to be ex uh, exogenous. But the switch, at least with respect to the, the, the framework, uh, is hard to, to be considered exogenous because the main idea was the zero lower bound, which is not an exogenous, exogenous state. And finally, the average inflation target is only one component of, of, of the rule, as at least the strategic review uh, a rule. So uh, uh, to include, to, to, to have ideas how to incorporate this, this, uh, this part in the, in the rule would be uh, uh, greatly appreciated. So I'd like to say that's important, provocative, timely paper, and future work could be uh, directed to understand better the, 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 the perceived rules, what are the components of the rule, and how to better model this. But I also wanted to add that this is uh, uh, asking, actually, this is a challenging work, especially being in a context when central bankers themselves are not clear about their role. Thank you, Juliana. Maybe Luigi, you want to respond quickly to Claudiana. In the meantime, you can think of very smart questions to follow up with, please. No, I wanted to thank you for the, uh, for the discussion. So um, on, on the data side, I thought it was very interesting like to, um, like, you know, to confront uh, the measure that we have with other measurement of uh, this systematic uh, component of monetary policy that you have in your work, so where you find more um, uh, time variation, and that's kind of interesting, like these are two different objects, uh, but in principle they should be consistent with each other at, at some basic mm -hmm. level, so that's something that we haven't thought about and we, we will think about. So uh, on, the, um, on the suggestion that you had on the, uh, on the model, I agree with you that, uh, you know, this is kind of a first pass, like we basically took the kind of the simplest way of thinking about uh, flexible average inflation targeting, which was this introducing this backward looking average in the, in the Taylor rule. But of course, the actual framework review was more than just that. Like there was the, uh, the, the changes on the, on the output gap and the, the, the fact that they would be asymmetric. So uh, now the way that I think about that is like in the data, we have identified this target, which is this sensitivity. That doesn't mean that the Fed is not responding, uh, um, you know, is, is not uh, responding to inflation per se as it used to be before. It could be that there are other changes in the rule that in reduced form would basically uh, show up as a reduction in the sensitivity of nominal rates to inflation. So uh, the way that I inter, like one way that we could think about is basically 
have uh, the rule that you suggested and then do the analysis uh, uh, as we did, like targeting the same empirical targets in the data. And that's something that we can, uh, uh, that we can uh, uh, try. So uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question here in front, in the front row. Please, uh, even if we know you, please state quickly who you are and let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Shebnam uh, Kalem Leolskan, Brown University. A fantastic paper and great discussion. Um, I would like to come back to this point. Uh, the discussions also raise uh, in terms of, you know, it is a success from the perspective of uh, the policymaker bringing the, you know, the expectations and the bond market where they want, but it's a policy failure if you look at the real economy. I would like to push back on that. It's a policy failure if you look at the real economy from the lens of this bond. Right. If you write down another model that takes the labor market slackness and tightness that we experienced in 2021 and 2022 seriously, it's not a failure because it definitely worked by responding late. Both Fed and ECB made the jobs protected. Right. In fact, they allowed the relocation of the of the employment exactly from the sectors that was slack to sectors tight, and that that's led to the whole labor market tires and all that. So which this model is going to fail to achieve. In, in fact, you know, now I have written three papers on both Euro area and US inflation. We can match also inflation very well uh, without targeting anything. And our papers don't say that it was dovish monetary policy. But there are also other papers in the spirit of this, the minute we write down this new Keynesian model where the entire supply shock goes to the markup and the demand goes to discount factor without accounting for this heterogeneity, which is very important for the last two years of inflation, that is like what we see in terms of the services sectors, manufacturer sector and labor market and inflation. So then, you know, you don't have a problem coming from Dovish Monter. Then Dovish Monter also stops being the explanation of inflation, actually. So in that sense, um, you know, I think it's very model specific uh, because if you look at the employment side, it really helped also a lot to keep your jobs. I mean, you, you, you said this is a reduced form way of capturing this, but it is, uh, to me, super reduced form of way of capture to this, right? If you look at the programs uh, in Europe and in the United States, they are in trillions, and they meant to, even in the United States, if, if you look at a program like PPP, they meant to keep the employment, right? So there's like a trillion spent on the firms so that they keep the jobs. So, uh, you know, putting it in a discount factor I, I, is Im immediately going to give you it is easy monetary policy that led to inflation, right? If you if you if you model it in a more you know the, with sectoral heterogeneity with input out languages, then you are not going to get the easy monetary policy gave you the inflation. Rather, you have this demand and supply shock combination, asymmetric across sector give you inflation. So, uh, I mean, first uh, the first part of the so thanks for the question. So the first part of your question, like. We actually don't do welfare at all in this in this um, paper, precisely because of what you are saying. Like, yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 we never say this is a failure or a success. So, like, we always say we want to kind of uh, it, it's a positive paper. So we we take a sort of a plain vanilla and Keynesian model. We try to do um, the analysis, and I agree, uh, the analysis is model specific in the sense that you know. You, you take a different model and you're gonna get a different answer. Now, I want to point out though, that the, as long as you have something like a new Keynesian Phillips curve, like a forward looking expression of nominal rates to, to, to the output gap, and as long as you have an Euler equation, you're gonna have that inflation response to, to uh, short and long-term rates. And uh, what we are doing essentially is we are trying to use the bond market to measure as much I mean, uh, as, as well as we can, to what extent expectation of future long-term rates changed during this period relative to before. And then I think, so that part, I think we are sort of, uh, you know, I would say we, we've done uh, ask a careful job, or at least that's, that's uh, now, now going from the, par the part to the actual number that we find, which is 4% effect on inflation and a much lower output gap which is also in the paper. So to go there, then it's all about the new Keynesian model. So that part, I agree with you, is, is gonna be model specific and um, we can think about how to make it more robust. Uh, but yeah, I, I, so I basically agree a lot with the spirit of your question. Yeah. We have time for one more concise <laughs> question. Uh, Roberto was first, I think, okay.
and one continue. Thank you. Um, one question regarding uh, how shall we, I mean, I'm not sure I understood how to connect the results of a model simulation with the literature, where uh, uh, the literature showing the, the average inflation targeting is, uh, even if uh, the window is not too long, is already a good proxy for price level targeting. So in this sense, uh, bygones are never bygones. Uh, and uh, if, uh, uh, if, like if policy is slow to respond, uh, will be also slow in responding when uh, the inflation goes down. So you should get symmetry at the end. And uh, um, like also relate to this, this means that even leaving aside the forward guns powder and so on, but uh, in thinking about the counterfactual, uh, one should think that, uh, I mean, the counterfactual starts in a way earlier where uh, um, without uh, such a policy, one would expect that at the zero lower bound, uh, you would have get uh, uh, very large costs. Uh, and this is just uh, sort of compensating so that over the longer term, uh, you should even be able to get a symmetry in the price uh, in the, your inflation target, uh, even with the asymmetry. So I was not sure how to connect these to standard results with what you showed. So um, basically, one thing is like the counterfactual is a conditional statement. So we start from a world in which we have uh, we are way away from, we are well away from the from the steady state. So we are going to basically have markup shocks that are above trend and demand shocks that are uh, above below trend, like they, they are away from the city state. So initially what you're doing is you're not responding forcefully, but eventually you are gravitating to the ergodic mean of the rule. So like, I think what you have in mind is something where you are permanently in that regime and you have a shock and you know, today you respond less, but then tomorrow you respond more. Here instead is like, you have a shock that makes you respond less but then eventually the rule converges to the ergodic distribution. <coughs> so that's why you get some kick out of, uh, out of this. I don't know if this clarified your, your question, if, if that was the question. You may also, of course, take the rest of the conference and continue later. Ah, also yeah, no, sure. also for, the, for the third question, we, I think we need to move on. So thanks for the questions up to here. As Massimo said, we have diversity. So this was uh, focus on the Fed. Next paper is focus on this house. Uh, Christian, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much uh, for having this paper on the program. Uh, my co-authors, Philipp Pinan, Max Schleritzko, and Mike Schmeling, and I, we are thrilled to, to be part of this program. And as you will see, there's essentially no better place for us to present this because this is a paper about ECB press conferences, and, and here we are. So obviously, um, everybody here is aware of how important the question is, how monetary policy impacts financial markets and the real economy. That's why we are here today. And uh, we all know it's tricky to identify monetary policy effects. So a standard practice in, in the past years has, been, has become uh, to look at small time windows around policy announcements and to assess how asset prices change in these small time windows. The idea being, if you take a high frequency time window around the Fed announcement, an ECB announcement, then the news coming out of these announcements should dominate the information that hits markets and we should see, we should be able to read something out of asset price responses. So if you see that interest rates go up, that might be indicating a tightening shock. More recently, papers have been suggesting to look at multiple assets at the same time for example, Carlo Altovilla and his co uh, proposed to look at the whole term structure of interest rates. Marek uh, Jaroczynski um, and, and his co-author Jaroczynski Karadi uh, suggest to look at the co-movement of interest rates and stocks because that might be also providing additional information. You might see the interest rates go up indicating a tightening shock. But if you see at the same time that stock prices also go up, there must be some else in terms of news coming out of the announcement, something that tells us the economy is looking strong and even offsetting, more than offsetting the interest rate effect. Okay? So there are several of these shock measures out there proposed by the literature. 
what they have in common, though, is that they are kind of only providing indirect evidence as to what the drivers of the shocks are. Because what they essentially do is you look at asset prices and then you use economic intuition or a model to think about, well, given that we see the asset prices moving in that direction, what must have been the type of news that caused this movement? And the idea of our paper is, is very simple. It's an empirical paper where we say, well, let's just connect the asset price responses directly to the communication of the central bank and see, in a way, if what the market appears to hear is consistent with the, what the central bank, in our case, the ECB, says. Okay? So what we do is we use communication data to try to uh, measure the topic-specific stances of the ECB. And we show that asset prices move or respond to changes in the topic-specific stances. We see that there is a lot of time variation in the communication effects that we find in financial markets. And that this time variation, as well as the, the fact that different assets respond to different topics at different times, has implications both for how communication can be used by a central bank, but also as to how we interpret conventional measures of monetary policy shocks, which do not account for this time variation. Okay? So I don't have time for the literature. I'm just saying a lot of the work that we build on comes out of this house, literature on central bank communication, on the measurement of monetary policy shocks, as well as textual analysis of policy decisions. Okay? So I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the timing of ECB communication. This has slightly changed over time, but for our sample, which is uh, from 2002 to June 2021, the timing has always been that there was a press release about the ECB's decision at 1.45, and 45 minutes later, there's a press conference starting with an introductory statement and then a Q&A. Uh, with the help of the uh, Euro Air Money policy event study database put together by Alta Villa et al. and frequently updated, we can disentangle market responses to the press release and to the press conference. Okay? So using the timeline that you see here, we can see how markets respond first to the press release and 45 minutes later, uh, the time window for the press conference starts. Now, first thing that you should note, because that question comes up from time to time, especially for people who are more, more used to working with the Fed, the asset price responses um, to the press release and to the press conference are essentially unrelated. So what I'm showing you here are pictures of six assets. Um, let's just look at a two-year OIS rate. You see the correlation is 0 0.07. It's actually on the higher side compared to the other assets that we have here. Uh, but it's not like that you can use what you hear or see from the press release to predict what's going to happen during the press conference. What you can also see is that the magnitudes of the shocks are comparable. And for some assets, actually, the shocks or the market movements during the press conference are larger than uh, when the actual information about the decision hits the market. Okay? So we are going to focus on a press conference because we want to decipher asset price responses, so we need verbal text, we need communication, and that's what we get from the press conference. And fortunately for us, over our sample period, the press conference has always been structured in five topics in a very coherent way. Uh, monetary policy tools, economic activity, inflation, financial and monetary conditions, fiscal policy and structural reforms, no need to do topic modeling, whatever, it's really structured that way. Okay? And what we want to capture is uh, the ECB stance towards this topic. So kind of, I'm, I have a quote here from the account of the monetary, monetary policy meeting of the ECB from April 27, uh, 2017, uh, which says, as had been suggested by Mr. Pred in his introduction, nuances in the communication could convey a more positive tone on the state of the economy while signaling less urgency for further monetary policy action. So our ambition is to try to find measures that actually capture these ideas during the press conference. Okay? So the four, for the four topics, other than monetary policy tools, we take the simplest possible off-the-shelf approach that we can think of. 
It's been used, it's coming out of corporate finance actually, but it's been used in monetary economics several times as well, quite with I think uh, some success, but I might be biased there. We're, we're using the financial dictionary of Lovren and McDonald to identify negative words in the ECB press conferences. And then it's a very simple word counting exercise with all the pros and cons that come with that. And I'm happy to discuss this later. So what we measure is the ECB's topic specific stance really from these four topics that I'm listing here. Uh, simply as one minus the ratio of negative words to that topic over the number of total words related to that topic. And then we'll mostly work with the change in stance in an attempt to capture news. Okay? For monetary policy tools, we classify uh, rate guidance and unconventional policy by hand. We follow the QGE paper of Hans and McMahon. These, the, the, the comments on rate guidance are kind of too nuanced to capture with the simple word count approach. Um, so we uh, classify indications of tightening, indications of easing, are uh, not any indication by plus one, zero, minus one, respectively. And we do that similar for unconventional monetary policy, but that only serves as a control variable for several reasons, okay? So let me quickly summarize the, the results uh, for a range of asset classes as to how um, market prices respond to these topic-specific stances before we go into detail. If you can't read the numbers, don't worry. What matters more is, is the colors. So the dar darker shaded uh, a box is, the more significant the result is. So the idea that we have is we take a response variable, say interest rates, stock prices, or whatever, and regress this on the changes in the topic-specific stances and a bunch of control variables, okay? The idea is really that we want to include a good approximation for the market participants' information set going into the press conference because there might be good reasons why you might anticipate the ECB to become more positive or negative with respect to a particular topic, okay? So in detail, I'm going to show you this for the three-month OIS rate. You find in simple univariate regressions that the three-month UIS rate response during the press conference is significantly related to changes in rate guidance, positively, significantly related to changes in economic activity, and a little bit to financial and monetary conditions. When you put all of these five stance changes together, what remains is the significant positive relation with rate guidance and to some extent to economic activity. But then as soon as you enter the other control variables, what really sticks is rate guidance, which is kind of intuitive. So what are the other control variables? We control for the press release shock and the indicator on unconventional monetary policy to make sure that what we look at is really not associated with what we've heard 45 minutes before. There's an, uh, an attempt to control for inflation in the sense whether we are above the target or below. We control for previous stance changes in case the ECB is not only slowly adjusting interest rates, but maybe slowly adjusting its communication. We account for intermeeting speeches by ECB executive board members because we know the, these are important for markets as well, and they might hint at something that might be happening later. We control for financial market conditions by controlling in stock market changes, interest rate changes, stock market volatility from the previous press conference to the current press conference, and we control for changes in the macro projections by the ECB to make sure that what we capture is not just a verbal summary of the projections. Okay? So, for the OIS three-month rate, we see what remains significant in this analysis with all the control variables is rate guidance. And for the, for the other assets, I'm only going to show you the results with all these control variables in place. Okay? So we're going to look at interest rates of different maturities, three-month, two-year, ten-year. Three-month we've already seen is related to rate guidance, two years more to news about economic activity, positive news, so a significant coefficient after all these controls on economic activity, 
is associated with increases in the two-year rate in that time window. And there's a significant relation to rate guidance as well. For the 10-year rate, there's a marginal significant effect related to news about financial monetary conditions. Exchange rates, very briefly, are related to news about financial monetary conditions, good news communicated by the ECB about financial monetary conditions, euro becomes stronger. Okay? Uh, for sovereign spreads and equities, uh, well, for equities, and that was kind of surprising to us in the first take, but we'll see uh, how we address this later, there's no response to any of the topic news communicated by the ECB. For sovereign yield spreads, probably not surprisingly, there is some link to news about fiscal policy in the sense that when the ECB becomes more positive about fiscal policy and structural reforms, sovereign spreads narrow. But that doesn't appear to be a strong effect in the full sample. We'll say this changes in subsamples. Now let's move at other, to look at structural monetary policy shocks estimated either from the term structure of interest rates or from the co-movement of stocks and interest rates. So I'm looking on the right side at the Alta Villa et al factors, timing, forward guidance, and QE, and kind of uh, consistent with the intuition that we get from that paper, we see that the timing factor, which is kind of the one at the short end of the yield curve, is related uh, to news about rate guidance, the forward guidance factor, middle of the yield curve, to news about economic activity, the QE factor at the long end of the yield curve more to news about financial and monetary conditions. So that kind of complies with the intuition which suggests there is a sensible link between the news that we measure from the text and the idea behind that approach. Uh, let's also look at the shocks uh, that consider the co-movement between stocks and bonds as an identification tool. Um, I have the policy and information shocks of Jaroczynski and Karadi to the left, and also kind of intuitively, the rate guidance uh, is positively associated with the policy shock. Uh, the information shock is positively associated with news about economic activity. So that's kind of intuitive. And for Cislak and Schrimpf, where the, where the monetary and growth shocks are very similar to the policy and information shocks, there's a third shock because in their identification, they also include uh, long-term interest rates. We find that what they call risk premium shocks is inversely related to financial monetary condition news. That means good news about financial monetary conditions, lowered risk premium. Okay, so all of this kind of appears to uh, make sense uh, from an economic perspective, uh, intuitively at least. Uh, but now I'm going to spend uh, the rest of the time providing some, some details as to how the results might change over time and why possibly this might be the case. Okay, So we are working with the ECB because the ECB offers the longest time series for such a consistent communication strategy, uh, which uh, includes press conferences as a communication tool. Okay, so our sample, as I said, is from 2002 to 2021, which is great for the purpose of having enough data. And it's also great in the sense that we uh, have a sample that is long enough to provide us with substantial variation in financial and economic conditions and different times also for markets and, and policy makers as to how challenging they have been. Okay. So what we want to do in the next part is to assess the time variation um, of the results, these communication effects that I've shown, that I've briefly summarized before. Uh, and what we will see is that there are some state contingent, contingent communication effects, but there are also some trends as to how certain topics become more important over time. And depending on how much time I have at the end, I will also talk about the potential drivers behind the time variation in these communication effects. Okay. Now recall the interest rate results. I know that was quick, but I had to get here. So let me remind you uh, before I showed to you that in the full sample, interest rates are related to rate guidance news, economic activity news, financial and monetary con uh, condition news. Shorter end for rate guidance, economic activity two year, financial monetary conditions 10 year. 
Now let's start with rate guidance. And I've cut off the very end of the, the rolling plots because there is too little variation in rate guidance. But for each rolling window of six years, starting with 2002 to 2007, uh, and the latest one where I present data here is 2013 to 2018. I'm plotting this uh, response coefficient similar to the table for the three-month rate, the two-year rate, and the 10-year rate. In the first row here with respect to rate guidance. So what we see is at the beginning of the sample prior uh, to, to crisis times, the short-term rate response to news about rate guidance as you would expect. But you also see a response in two-year and 10-year rates, but much later. It appears that when the, uh, we are getting into the territory of the lower bound, rate guidance is perceived by markets really with respect to the two-year rates or even the 10-year rate because there is no room at the short end. When we look at the economic activity, uh, there's not much going on with respect to the three-month rate. Prior to uh, the crisis times, the two-year rate is significantly associated with economic activity news and very similarly for the 10-year rate. And finally, when we look at financial and monetary conditions, there is a time for interest rates of all maturities when financial and monetary conditions matter. It is, in particular, in the periods from the subsamples 2009 up to 2016, and it's stuck with the two year and 10 year yields, mostly for the two year. Okay? So, what this uh, seems to suggest is that different topics matter for different assets at different points in time. But when we look at interest rates, it's actually that the full sample results could almost be misleading because rate guidance and financial monetary conditions matter for all maturities, but at different points in our sample. And with financial monetary conditions having become a topic to which markets appear to respond in, in particular, from 2009 or 10 forward, okay? Now let's look at other examples, okay? So first one here is uh, the plot as to how exchange rates, in this case the euro US dollar exchange rate, responds to news about financial and monetary conditions. So about at the same time when we see that the long-term rate response uh, in interest rates um, becomes significant we also see that for uh, exchange rates. So if you remember in the full sample results, there was a significant full sample result that uh, the euro becomes stronger when there's good news about financial and monetary conditions. This is really just there after the financial crisis or since the financial crisis, okay? Let's look at sovereign spreads. Probably surprisingly, they were not very significant in their link to fiscal policy during, uh, be it during the full sample. But obviously, there is a very significant link between, in this case, the Spanish over Germany 10-year spread uh, to news about fiscal policy during the, the, the financial crisis, so the global financial crisis and the European sovereign debt crisis. And there is also a bounce back during the uh, most extreme COVID effects. And then uh, I've shown you in the full sample that there's no link between stocks and uh, news communicated by the ECB. Here it appears that at the beginning of the sample results that there was a significant link between stock responses during the press conference and news about economic activity, but it wasn't there later. But during the uh, peak of the financial crisis, there was also a significant link between stock market responses and the ECB's communication about the topic fiscal policy. So what this picture suggests is, as I uh, summarized before, there appear to be some state contingent effects, like the role of fiscal policy before and after the, uh, the Euro sovereign debt crisis. Markets did not appear to care that much. Uh, but there also seem to be more secular trends like the one related to financial and monetary conditions that we see in interest rates, exchange rates in particular. Okay? Now, um, where is this time variation coming from, right? So why do we see that different assets respond to different topics 
at different points in time. Um, so in other words, what we are interested in is to understand whether um, the communication effects variation over time might be more driven by the supply of communication, the supply of information by the central bank or by the demand for information by the market participants. A huge identif identification question, of course. That's why we try to keep it as simple as possible. And I'm, what I'm going to show you is more anecdotal, but I believe makes the point, hopefully, to, somewhat, uh, to some extent, convincingly. So our sample is designed to keep the supply of information more or less fixed. That's why our sample is specifically from January 2002 to June 2021, because in that period, exactly the same five topics have been discussed in the press conference. So in that sense, we would say the supply of information is kind of fixed. On the other hand, we believe that demand for information about a particular topic may change depending on how relevant the topic is perceived by market participants. So in that sense, we used the European sovereign debt crisis as a natural laboratory in the sense that this was a large shock to market participants. Obviously, there was a huge demand for news related to sovereign debt. But the ECB continued its um, communication strategy in the sense that it was still the same five topics the, it talked about. And also the amount of discussion of fiscal policy relative to other topics did not really change. Um, what's also nice about this uh, laboratory is that we have data on sovereign spreads, which are by definition useful to study the sovereign debt crisis. So um, what I'm plotting here is the time series of the uh, Spanish-German 10-year sovereign spread from way back in the mid-90s to remind us that actually in, in the mid-90s the sovereign spread was at around 5.5 percentage points. It was zero, that's a separate discussion why, uh, zero going into our sample. And then during 2012, it peaked at a bit more than 6%. Okay? And uh, remember from before, we've seen that sovereign spreads become significantly linked to fiscal policy in that period. Okay? And I'll try to, to convey the intuition that we have based on these pictures here. So this is again the level of the uh, Spanish-German sovereign spread, but now only on ECB meeting days. Here we have the press release shock, so changes in the sovereign spread during the press release at 145. And here we have the press conference shock, so the changes in the sovereign spread 45 minutes later. So what we see is obviously when the spread is zero, the changes during press release and press conference are also zero. Obviously, there was no news in what way uh, ever that could have changed market participants' approach to pricing the Spanish bond different from the German bond. That only started slowly when, uh, you know, the spread started increasing slightly in 2007, and it reached 1% in 2009, and then its peak in 2012. But what you see, and, and let's just focus on that time until 2015, what you see is, when you look at the number of words or the share of the press conference dedicated to fiscal policy, that didn't really change that much over that period. Also, the level of the stance and the dynamics of the stance changes, they didn't change um, visibly and also econometrically in reasonable ways that we can think of. But it's only then that we see large shocks associated with the ECB's press conference and the topic of fiscal policy. So to us, this suggests, even this is not a formal identification, given that no news whatsoever moved um, spreads prior to the crisis, but the ECB communicated about fiscal policy anyways, that it's then a demand effect that fiscal policy all of a sudden matters for sovereign spreads, not that the ECB has changed its supply of information. So this is kind of one piece of evidence that demand effects, the perceived topic relevance of market participants might be behind at sometimes the significant between asset price responses and ECB communicated news being significant and at other not. The other anecdote, if you will, I give you or another reason as to why we believe that there might be variation in the 
communication effect over time is that you know now I hope that we've convinced you that the new CCB communicates matters for asset prices, but this can also go in a way that the ECB doesn't like in the sense that markets might perceive communication as uh, not very helpful. So as an example, um, we're looking at the ECB decisions on December 3, 2015. On that day, uh, the ECB decided to lower the deposit rate by 10 basis points. Uh, the APP was extended in terms of duration, reinvestments, and asset eligibility, but the volume remained uh, the same at 60 billion per month. Okay? What happened on that day is that stock markets dropped sharply because market, par market participants had expected a bigger rate cut, so we see a huge drop on the announcement during the press release in the stock market, but also later during the press conference. They had expected an increase in the APP volume, and they also appear to have viewed the ECB's uh, post-announcement communication during the press conference as insufficiently clear as to what had been going on. So I have a few quotes from the Financial Times kind of making this point. The modest package, including an extension of QE to at least six months, and the tone of Mr. Draghi's press conference suggested the ECB Council was not in one place. And looking at the macro assessment, it looks as if almost unchanged growth and inflation forecast, as well as positive assessment of the impact from QE up to now, laid the grounds for the ECB's rather reserved policy reaction. So markets perceive as the ECB not being in one place. They believe that there is something in a macro assessment that draws, uh, that suggests that the QE effect was much stronger that the markets appear to have anticipated. Overall, it kind of suggests that because there was not clear enough information as to why the ECB reached these decisions, especially not expanding the volume of APP, the market participants had to speculate about the potential reasons. Okay, and one quote hinted at the macroeconomic assessment of the ECB. Um, remember that I've shown to you that stock prices do not respond to economic activity news in the full sample, only in the first half of the sample. It turns out, and I don't have time anymore to go into details, if we were to exclude this one observation where the macro assessment of DCB was indeed positive, our stance measure improves, but at the same time, stock markets still drop sharply, if we were to exclude this one extreme outlier in terms of T-statistic erosion, then actually we would have a full sample significant link between stock market responses and news about economic activity. Okay? So what this kind of suggests is that uh, communication is important. And what one also can take away from here is that time variation in these communication effects on financial markets might simply also be due to some communication being more effective than other. Okay? So I'm essentially out of time. Let me just conclude with the implications very briefly. So central bank communication affects markets. Uh, it's a flexible state contingent tool. You can, as a central bank, with your communication, you could actually target particular assets by explaining a decision rather in the economic activity part of the press conference or in the financial and monetary conditions part, right? This brings a little bit of challenge or, you know, you have to be aware of that when you look at the interpretation of conventional shock measures. Take, for example, uh, long versus short-term interest rates or, stock, uh, or uh, shock measures that involve stock prices. At some points, stocks are driven by economic activity. At some, by fiscal policy, you should be aware of that, okay? And I didn't have time to talk about transmission channel and asset pricing. We believe the results speak to a risk-based channel in which intermediaries play an important role. Thank you. Okay, then um, let me also thank the organizers for having me for uh, this discussion of this very interesting paper, and I will jump right into the discussion by giving a quick recap of, of what was a very comprehensive paper um, and um, brought it down to, to the key question, which was um, 
do markets hear what the central bank actually says and can we kind of quantify that? Um, as Christian presented, this has been done by a text analysis which um, helps us quantify the ECB's tone on specific topics that it regularly addresses uh, during the press conferences. And then this is put into a relationship to uh, financial asset price changes. Uh, and the key results, um, very briefly, are yes, ECB communication during the press conference is a significant driver of asset prices, um, but it depends on the topic. Um, and moreover, it depends on um, the state of the economy, and we saw that it's time varying, so it's not constant over time. Um, and yeah, my, my main comments, so first of all, I thought it's a, it's a very well-crafted paper. Um, it's, it's very rich in content and empirical analysis, so full of inspiration, um, and certainly interesting for anyone interested in, in central bank communication and um, how it influences financial markets, um, and especially in today's communication environment, I find it uh, highly relevant. Um, so on my part, I will actually um, also focus on this tax analysis approach, um, where we'll first of all try to compare it with um, different approaches that we have nowadays. Um, I will discuss a little bit the validity of the tone indicators. So um, it's basically about the question um, of, of how reliable um, it is to say that they measure what we want to measure. Um, and I'm going to briefly touch upon macroeconomic insights that we may draw from that. Um, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time and go directly to uh, a quick overview of text analysis approaches, right? Because I think nowadays when, when someone mentions uh, text analysis, Gen AI quickly pops up and everybody's thinking about, a new, uh, about these new large language models. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, in, in this case that, that we're speaking of AI, nor is it necessary, necessary uh, in this case. So we can do sentiment analysis dictionary based, as we've just seen. So you can count words um, to come up with an indicator. Uh, alternatively, also kind of dictionary based, you could think of n-grams, which are basically groups of words um, to get a hint of, uh, of the sentiment on a specific topic. Or on the other side of the spectrum, you can indeed go to large language models. There are smaller ones like the BERT models from Google. Um, and there are the large ones that everybody knows now, like GPT, Gemini, um, and you name them. And I think one um, important dimension across which you can sort them is uh, the context they take into account, right? Um, so here from left to right, you could argue that counting words, there you don't really care what's around those words, right? So you don't care about the context. Um, if you go to words of groups like n-grams, you already take into uh, account somewhat more context. And the more you go to the right, if you take a large language model, then this model would actually take into account all the context you could think of, right? So this is an important difference. And for the remainder of this uh, presentation, uh, I have results from three of those methods. So this is the word count um, that Christian presented. I have results from, the, from an n-gram model that um, has been run by colleagues of mine here at the ECB. And um, I will show results from a Roberta model uh, that, that I'm currently running with some colleagues also here at the ECB. So going to my first comment, which is more of a question, and I already said it, um, that is what is being measured. So I have two points to make on this slide, and I will focus on the left-hand side chart, which is showing the inflation sentiment indicator. So in yellow, um, that's the one from the paper we've just heard of. Um, in green, you see the results from um, the Ngram model, and in blue, it's, uh, it's results from a, from a Roberta model. And first of all, what you see is they do differ. Um, and since they differ, um, a question is, why do they differ? And which one of those is actually more successful and capturing the inflation sentiment of the central bank during a press conference, right? And now you can think of many ways probably how to um, try to get a sense of that. What I did here is simply correlating it with realized inflation, which you see in red. Um, and then you see the rolling correlation in the, in the lower panel. And um, the first thing that jumped my eye is that actually the sentiment indicator that we've seen today has a very low correlation with inflation. So the question was, what does it measure? So what is influencing the ECB sentiment on inflation if it's not realized inflation itself? And you see that from the other models, I get very different results, just as an example. So their correlation is up to 80%, right? And you can do the same thing for the economic sentiment indicator on the right-hand side. Um, results are very similar and, and in principle raise the same questions, right? Um, and turning to the rate guidance indicator on the left-hand side, that's the exact same exercise. Um, I'm not going to repeat um, the inference, though, because here I actually want to focus on its stability, especially after 2008. So what we've seen today is the yellow line. So this is the rate guidance indicator from the paper. 
and you see that after the financial crisis, it's quite stable. Um, and I thought it's surprisingly stable because um, when I compare this with other shocks, and, and here on the right-hand side, I've plotted those from the Alta Villa database. So there we've got the target shock, the timing shock, the forward guidance shock, and they all kind of relate to um, the short end of the yield curve um, and, and to rate guidance, I would argue. And you see that after 2008, there is actually a lot of action. So there's no stability at all, right? So there's a lot of things going on. And just to illustrate, I want to, I want to pick one specific example, which is, it's hard to see, but it's, it's this one here, which is the March 2020 press conference. So the first press conference after the uh, COVID pandemic really um, kicked in. And it's a large target shock on that date. And it's a large target shock because on that date, the ECB did not change its interest rates, nor did it change its communication on them because it was a standard phrase, right? Uh, and it doesn't show up at all in the rate guidance indicator, but it for sure does show up um, in financial market prices. So I'm just wondering if um, this stability, um, is, if we can trust that. And I want to take this one press conference also to make another point. And for that, I'm zooming in into the intraday data of that day. Um, to show the following. So on the left-hand side, you have five-year OS rates. On the right-hand side, it's the Italian versus German 10-year spread. And um, two things. So there are light gray areas, and this is basically the time window, the paper used to compute the financial asset price changes, right? So this is the change over the entire press conference. The light blue um, area marks the first 30 minutes of that press conference. So this is roughly covering the time during which the monetary statement is read out. Um, and during which these topics are addressed by, by, the, um, by the president. And you see that a lot of action is actually outside of this light blue window. Um, and we can focus on the right-hand side chart because that's probably the more interesting and illustrative. So this is the spread, and you see a large jump um, outside of this blue area. That was during the Q&A. And during that Q&A, we had this famous, we are not here to close spread quote um, that, that caused this jump, right? But it's not, during the press statement, but it will be affecting the results, I would argue, of this, of this regression when you take the tone indicators and regress them on that, uh, or take, you take the change in the asset prices and regress it on the tone indicator. So my, my question here would be, do the Q&A play a large role over your sample, and is it important to take them more specifically into account? Um, my last comment is um, on the significance of the results. Um, I think one thing the paper might profit from is indeed to also look at the economic significance of the communication, right? So it's, it's already great to see that we are, um, as ECB, kind of significantly um, driving the market, but what about inflation and economic activity, which ultimately is what we aim at, right? And this is um, results just as an example from, from colleagues um, here at the ECB who use this n-gram approach um, and who have published these results just more, uh, recently in an ECB blog. So that might be something to, to look into. Um, yeah, and then some, some minor comments um, I would add. Um, you already mentioned that you do look at the inter-meeting speeches, and I was surprised that, that you didn't look in, uh, into them in more detail, because I think that, that would, would be a good complement to the press conferences, right? And, and also um, using your approach, so um, the topic identification is, is actually a very nice exercise that could deserve some more space. Um, the second thing is, I, don't, I didn't see um, in your control variables the US data release, which comes out just before the press conference, I think very regularly, and which often has a very large impact. So I think that is something that is definitely missing in the, in the control data set. Um, and then, uh, as Claudiana said it before, uh, my wish would be, um, maybe you, you could look into to more recent language models just to, to robustify the results that you, that you have. Um, in your empirical exercises. Um, yeah, and I will stop with that and, and, and just a short summary. Um, again, I, I think this is a very comprehensive and very nice paper, which is definitely recommended to anyone interested in high frequency shocks uh, and in understanding the importance of central bank communication. So uh, really well done and um, was a pleasure to, to read and discuss it. And yeah, the main comments I, I gave. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you very much, Fabian. Um, a, a lot of good comments. Uh, and I actually agree with everything that you're saying. So I really liked your, um, the picture that you had of the different type of textual analysis models from no context to context. We're definitely on the very far end of this. 
um, because we only count the words. But the cool thing about the ECB press conference is because the ECB discusses the different topics and we can uniquely identify a topic, the no context argument doesn't bite that much in the sense that we do not specifically know what they talk about economic activity, for example, but at least we know how the tone associated with economic, is an, uh, associated with economic activity and not another topic. But I also totally agree one could use other models. For us, you know, what we really wanted to do is something that we can use, something that we can take off the shelf and apply in real time for several reasons. Otherwise, it's not, not possible to understand how markets might have perceived what was going on if we calibrate it over a long period. And also the corpus, some of the methods, I, I mean, I'm curious to see what you're doing, but if you were just to use the ECB press conference statements for many of the approaches, my understanding is the corpus is almost too small. Um, then probably, well, the Q&A, we have deliberately not included the Q&A, and you're right that uh, there could be movements after the statement is read by, by the president that is in, in our asset price response on the left-hand side. Um, that might be the case. That's why we de decided in the end not to talk about communication shocks or something, but only about news that kind of reflect the stance of the ECB. There is this, you know, there could be some timing effect going on, but also there we decided we take the altered will data base because it's there, everybody uses it. But yes, there will be robustness checks looking at this in more detail, I agree on that. Um, yeah, and the, the example that you gave on rate guidance from March 2020, um, I would say it's exactly like we want because as you said yourself, there is little response in our indicator on rate guidance, but that has to be the case because as you said, the communication hasn't changed and therefore we do not want to see any change in the rate guidance indicator. Uh, there might be a response in the asset prices, but it should not change our rate guidance indicator because if the communication hasn't changed, it should be zero. This is, of course, very different compared to looking at the Alta Villa shocks or interest rate responses, which saw large movements exactly because there was no change in the stance. Yeah. So I, I have more responses, but I don't know if you yeah, want me. You can do bilaterally, if so yeah. that we have at least time for maybe one or two questions. Yeah. Um, Amy first, and then Sujit, yeah. and then Katarina. Uh, Amy Hanlon from Brown University. Uh, excellent presentation and excellent discuss discussion. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on uh, just echoing some of the discussant points, uh, in particular that with dictionary methods, uh, and, and from the paper that you cited for the word list you used from, from Lofren and, and McDonald, the main point of the paper is that the list of words that you use is, and if you change that list of words, your results can be very sensitive to changing the, those words. So one thing that I think would be interesting is even if you wanted to stay in the dictionary space is having topic specific uh, dictionaries. Uh, this is something that if you do an expansion of the Hansen and McMahon uh, contra contractionary and expansionary word lists, then you can end up actually overturning direction results, depending on which word you include, if you add synonyms or not. So thinking about the word list that you choose should be topic specific, and you should be careful on, on how you build that. The, the, the second question I have is, is more, or it, the second point I have is more of a question uh, about your assumption of fixed information supply, uh, specifically thinking about intermeeting information changing. So Claudiana's paper shows that there's a lot more interviews and attention to interviews. So there's information on uh, rate guidance as well as other expectations from uh, ECB members. So just wondering how you think about that increasing information outside of the press conferences affecting the results. Thanks. Let us collect the questions and okay. uh, collectively because, and let's be concise, Sujit, I think, was next. Thanks. Thanks very much for um, Super interesting uh, paper. Um, just two questions. One is on this changing demand for information mm. that you say um, maybe, um, you know, changing the, the sensitivity to different types of uh, information at different points in time. So I can think of this like narratives form and there's a pretty particular narrative of an interest in fiscal policy around the time of the sovereign debt crisis. But to what extent 
there's also a sort of line of thinking that says narratives are reflective in in the news that gets reported. So are you looking at controlling for, say, the what, what the wires are saying about the press conference in parallel to the statement being read? Or what, you put FT, FT quotes on, on the slide, for example. Those FT quotes might have been published in real time. I don't, I don't know what the timing was. But it could actually be not actually what investors are looking at in terms of the demand for information. It could be what, what newspapers or news wires are supplying to the market. It could be driving... What, what the interest is, so they may be focusing on particular narratives and could that be driving the effects that you see, the time varying effects. And yeah, the second point is very similar to the point that's been being raised on dictionary methods. I mean, you're only looking at negative sentiment. I was a bit surprised by that. Why not look at positive sentiment? But I share basically all of the comments of the previous, of, of Amy. Thanks. Thank you. Last question by Jérôme Henry. Thanks, Wolfgang. You introduced myself. I'm at the ECB. Um, I love the fact that you zoomed in a presentation on the fiscal and the impact on sovereign risk premia, because I was really wondering and was quite puzzled uh, by your overall results. But then you show the, the time variation, and I still remain puzzled. So I don't know whether my question is methodological or purely clarification. Namely, you say these are discussions or around the fiscal factors that explain this. But if we think about what happened close to event studies, like be it the TPI or the PEP, we see action there, and these are monetary policy steps. So I wondered how this is captured. Is that under the fiscal, or is that captured somewhere else in your wording buckets? But then how come it does not appear? Thank you. We have to conclude, I, I fear. Um, thanks for your great interest. We can continue over lunch. Christian, maybe quickly back to the three. Okay, I, I thought it wasn't the last one. No, please, please, no, go no, ahead. No, no, we take over. Okay, so I'll try to be uh, uh, quick. Uh, Amy, yes. Topic specific dictionary, we still have to do. Uh, what I've, we've done is the Call of Words uh, by Diego Garcia uh, dictionary that came out two years ago, but that is again a finance, not an economics dictionary that looks a little stronger actually. Uh, but you're right. Also, if it's just word counting, we can play with the word of list, a list of words. I'm happy to look at that. You also, I also agree, and probably I didn't explain it that well, um, with respect to the intermediate communication, that's obviously important. What we do with this intermeeting control is that we map the ECB board members' speeches into the topics of the press conference in order to account for the possibility that these intermeeting speeches, like whatever it takes or so, is changes the anticipation of market participants. And since we also um, account for the changes in financial markets, stock prices, interest rates, volatility, at least we try to capture these effects, okay? Um, the question about news, more generally, I think that was your question, right? Um, it's an interesting point. I actually do look a little bit at uh, Reuters news data, which I have in a millisecond timestamp, not in that paper. Uh, but I think it's going to be a bit tricky to really nail it down in, in, in real time to, to the second, um, also suggest, as suggested by uh, Fabian regarding the precise point in time in the press conference, whether it's during the statement or during the Q&A or so. I, I think that might, uh, might be a challenge. But I like, uh, I like the idea, and I would love to do more on this. Uh, and related to the last question, so the, the ECB press conference is structured in five topics. One of them being money, one of that being monetary policy tools. And that is the topic that we then split up. In, in the beginning of the sample, it's only rate guidance. Later on, it also includes information about unconventional policy actions. So all the uh, unconventional actions should be in there. And then there is a separate section that, if I recall correctly, is called fiscal policy and structural reforms. And there, if I remember that correctly, uh, there is an urgency to uh, ensure that balances are sound. I, I can't remember the wording. So when I talk about fiscal policy, it's net of any unconventional actions. It's really a text that doesn't include that. OK, 
Okay. Thank you, Christian. So um, one housekeeping remark before concluding. We have lunch across the hall. We will reconvene here at 2 o'clock with session 2 on monetary policy, credit and banking, chaired by Carlo. And uh, let me thank again our great presenters and discussants, Luigi, Claudiana, Christian and Fabian, and give them another